say welcome to, a, uh, to 2019 and to the first AIA Las Vegas member meeting of the year. We begin this very special year with a new emphasis on our community and how architects can use their problem-solving skills to improve it. We have a new chapter president and a new theme aligned with the national in, uh, initiative called Blueprint for Better. And this year, we will be working to solve problems of homelessness and affordable housing in Las Vegas. And to lead us through that objective this year, I am proud to introduce the 2019 AIA Las Vegas president, Dwayne Eschenbach, AIA. Well, thank you, Randy, and thank you all for being here tonight uh, and attending our program tonight. It's a big year for AIA Las Vegas, one that I think every one of us will want to be a part of. You might have heard the news that uh, there's something going on in Las Vegas in AIA National this year. We're hosting our national convention uh, from June 5th through the 10th of June. Um, AIA Las Vegas is providing over 150 educational tours of interesting and inspiring buildings and sites. In addition, we're planning to provide the AIA Hos Las Vegas Hospitality Lounge, um, located in the middle of the expo, and it's gonna be a great place to relax, learn more about exciting local projects, network, make connections, and learn about the newest visual and sound technology. If you'd like to attend the conference for free, see Ashley Gold. Is Ashley here tonight? I didn't see her. No, I was gonna have her stand up. She's our volunteer chair. And actually, if you volunteer to provide eight hours helping with sessions, tours, or events, uh, you get to attend the conference for free. And I think registration is kind of pricey, right? Like, Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what it is. I know it's a... Uh, well, uh, it's, I, can, it's I can give you the prices, but uh, um, a member price for the, the whole conference is $700. And it's, and a, it's a great event. If you volunteer, we've got some good opportunities uh, to, to attend free. Uh, and also, we still have excellent opportunities for sponsorships. We need those uh, local firms and, uh, and our friends to help sponsor these, these different events. Um, you can show your support for the chapter today by just contacting Randy, uh, Kelly, wave your hand, and Karen. I think most of you know them. And they can give you uh, full information on how to become a sponsor. All right, so now we want to recognize and thank the firms and individuals who support our chapter through sponsorships. We're very proud to have the support and partnership with our visionary sponsors, John A. Martin and Associates, Clyde Juba Wald Lecture Series, and Yesco. Thank you all. Our platinum sponsors are FEA Consulting Engineers, Harris Consulting Engineers, NV5, formerly JBA, Nevada Sales Agency, TJK Consulting Engineers, and our official photographer, 501 Studios. Thank you all. <laughs> our thanks to our gold sponsors, which are American Insurance and Investment, Assurance Limited, Southwick Landscape Architects, Terp Consulting, Locksaw Engineering, And our silver sponsors, ARIA Landscape Architecture, Bank of Nevada, Core Construction, DC Building Group, and La, is it Lage? Lage. Lage. Lage Design, I should know that. Thank you all. <laughs> AEC Cares will be in town during the A19 conference on architecture to link architecture and construction professionals to the community. Jennifer Turchin, AIA, our AIA Las Vegas past president and current AIA Nevada president, will come up and tell us a little bit more about that effort. Thank you, Duane. Every year during the AIA Conference on Architecture, AEC CARES, that's architects, engineers, and contractors, brings together Construct Connect, the AIA, and Hanley Wood, leading manufacturers, generous sponsors, and volunteers from across the US for a project that helps the host community. We're in the process of choosing a qualified nonprofit entity for this work, and we'll look to our membership to volunteer for this effort during the conference. 
You don't have to raise any sponsorship dollars or ask anyone for any project, products. We just need some architects, interior designers, and a couple general contractors um, to help with our project scope that'll be limited to cosmetic work in a single location within 20 minutes of the convention center. So we'll probably be doing something downtown or in the Maryland, Park, um, Maryland Parkway area. Uh, Laura Marlowe, who's the VP at Construct Connect, and Sandra Ho, a project manager, will begin an in-person team meeting in mid-March to review our project scope and design. Um, so if you want to be a part of this, uh, please let me know. Um, we're putting together the team now, and it'll be a really good project for the community. Um, so we could use your help. And that's just one day? Of It'll just be one day. It'll be on the Wednesday of the conference, which is June 5th. So that'll be the day that we build. And that'll be something you can sign up for as part of the conference as well. And we'll have probably between 100 and 150 volunteers from the attendees at the convention. I get the pleasure <laughs> of talking about uh, Bald by Design. So. Uh, one of our most successful and fun events is the annual St. Baldrick's Bald by Design program that raises money for childhood cancer. Our team has raised amazing amounts of money over the last 10 years. Phil, what's our 10-year total? Eight-year total is 715000 $715,000 in eight years. That's awesome. And here to tell you more about this year's event is Phil Ralston. He is our... Uh, chair of our Bald by Design team and an overall awesome human being. So here he is to talk about it. Yay! All right, first, I just want to say thank you to the AIA chapter and all the membership. Uh, you guys have really been great supporters for our team, both through participation and through fundraising. I, I like to kind of have any of the AIA members who are team members on Bald by Design stand up real quick whether it's this year or past years, everybody who's shaved, all right? And, and many more that aren't here tonight. Um, one, one thing I want to say, too, is um, we do this for an organization called the St. Baldrick's Foundation. St. Baldrick's raises over $30 million a year, and they fund research and childhood cancer initiatives uh, in clinics um, around the world, and they're participating in some of the breakthrough uh, discoveries that are affecting childhood cancer today. Um, so very proud of that, and they're making progress more and more. Um, the, I don't know if everybody knows, uh, if you've been here before you do, um, Wyndham Kimsey, who's one of your AIA member colleagues, uh, founded the team and it was really our participation. I'm, I was a good family friend, and I just kind of rode his coattails and started shaving when he started shaving. And it was because he had a 10-year-old daughter who was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, she has since been in remission for several years. She's 20. She turns 23 next month. She graduated college, is starting her master's next year, and she is shaving on our team this year. <clears throat> so we are very excited about that. Um, so, so if you can support, great. Uh, the, all, the, all the individual uh, fundraising websites are in the email that um, Randy and Kelly have sent out. Um, find somebody to support. If you'd like to shave, we always take volunteers, and it doesn't matter how much hair you have. If you just have a beard, I talked to one of the guys tonight, trying try to talk him in. You just shave your beard. Somebody will sponsor you. <laughs> we had a guy who barely had peach fuzz, and he raised three grand. So. <laughs> It works, and we are a great team. We, we love being affiliated with AIA, and we really, really appreciate all your support, whether by shaving or by funding uh, donations. So thank you. I know you've got a busy schedule. I'll end it there unless anybody has any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, and I'll see you in the chair in a couple of months. We're beginning the year with a very important initiative and one that I feel that all AI Las Vegas members can support. As I contemplated the, the theme for this year, I was drawn back to my, my junior year at UNLV uh, at the School of Architecture back, I'm going to date myself, but it was 1993. Uh, during, during that semester, we focused on the issues surrounding homelessness and affordable housing. Our class took a field trip to Los Angeles to learn more about Skid Row, homeless shelters, and SRO housing development. 
Uh, a year later, I don't know, some of you in this room probably remember, local architects were collaborating with the city on the MASH project, brought in architects from LA such as Morphosis, Hodgetts and Fung, Cappy and Cappy, uh, to design that MASH village. 24 years later, just this past November, I attended the 2018 Southern Nevada Homeless, Homelessness Summit put on by the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth. Um, and I was overwhelmed, one, by the number of organizations that were actually in that banquet hall working together on these issues. I walked in thinking I was going to be a part of a meeting with maybe 100 people or 50 people, and the room was ginormous and went on for days, and there were, I don't know how many people in that room, but it was overwhelming. And also, um, just the sheer number of the fact that homelessness is still an issue, a chronic issue all these years later. Um, is kind of overwhelming. Uh, before I introduce Patrick, our moderator, this evening, I'd like to recognize and thank some special guests at tonight's meeting. And please stand as I announce your name, and if you could hold your applause until we're finished, that would be great. Dr. May Worthy Thomas, the Affordable Housing Advocate for the Nev Nevada Department of Business and Industry Housing Division. Fulala Riley and Kelly Robinson, Help of Southern Nevada. Mandy Talleria, uh, an RID with the Good Deed Project, Lori Triboldi with Wind Design and Development. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. <laughs> a quick shout out to Lori. Uh, Lori is with Wind Development and uh, I've been fortunate to be working with her and her team in renovating the Shade Tree Women's Shelter. Uh, Wynn has really stepped forward and, and put a lot of money and effort and resources into into doing that, and it's, a, it's been a pleasure to work with them. Uh, my thanks to each of you for attending this evening. Uh, tonight we want to inspire all of you to take an active role in attacking and solving uh, the problems associated with affordable housing and homelessness in our community. If you're interested in being a part of the AIA team that works on these issues, please see Karen, Kelly, or Randy to sign up uh, so that you can receive notices that, uh, that come out here in the next few weeks. We need you, and together we can help solve uh, these problems for our community. To help begin our explorations into this blueprint for better, let's take a look at what some of the other communities have done with this video, Community by Design, Skid Row Housing Trust. We've become a culture that ignores people and looks the other way. Our homeless problem, especially in Los Angeles, is so large now that it's almost untenable. Los Angeles has the highest number of unsheltered people anywhere in the country, and clearly you can see that in Skid Row. There's a lot of suffering that goes on. If you're not ready to live in the streets, it gets pretty profound. For those individuals who have been largely isolated and alone, Beginning to try to build a sense of community is one of the essential goals. Skid Row Housing Trust is a nonprofit organization. We have a portfolio of 26 permanent support housing properties, mostly here in downtown Los Angeles, where we house some of the most vulnerable men and women who've experienced homelessness. I think what makes us really stand out is our focus on design. All of the projects that we've done with the Housing Trust looks at trying to create a type of semi-public social space within the building. The Star Apartments, from the beginning, meant to be as forward-thinking as possible. A very highly visible example of what solutions to homelessness can look like. I've known Mike for a long time, and this is really our first um, collaboration. The name of this project is The Six that we did for Mike, and that means that, in military terms, it means I've got your back. And really, Mike is The Six for homeless people. I think I was one of the first people who moved, who had keys, and I thought I, I, thought I was dreaming. And I came in and looked, it was empty. I was like, whose house is this? They said, yours. I got a little radio, a microwave, a crock pot. What more can you ask for? They have everything contained in their own unit, but then we have multiple groups, and some groups are provided by us, the RSCs, and some groups we have outside people come in. What makes good design is not what something looks like, 
but what it is like, meaning how you experience it. We have a ceramic group, garden group, yoga, the music jam, as you see. You know, I told you I was run over by a small pickup truck riding my bike. Well, things like these events, they help you recover. It took my breath away because I've been suffering for a number of years, suffering for years. And uh, what are you gonna expect, you know? Breaking stereotypes of the homeless goes back to design. It says something. It says we care about you. It's really a matter of educating the community, getting community support so that people kind of understand this can actually be a community asset. We are in actually the base of one of our 26 properties of the new Pershing, and we use it as our monthly concert event, Trust and Sound. Design definitely can empower individual. If you ask Mike, he'll tell you that good design is part of the healing. A little bit like Frank Sinatra, if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. No one has a bigger homeless crisis than we do here in Skid Row. I think it's absolutely a replicable model. All you need is the will to do it. These are our cities. Whatever we make here, whatever buildings we build here, they're part of the larger fabric that defines our cities. We're honored to have Patrick Panetta, AIA, with us tonight. Patrick is the Director of Project Management for the Arizona State University Real Estate Development Office. He's also served on the Institute's Strategic Council as a director for our Western Mountain Region and is responsible for bringing about the AIA National Initiative to address affordable housing and homelessness. He currently serves on the AIA National Treasure as the AIA National Treasurer, and he will facilitate tonight's panel discussion. Thank you, Duane. Thank you. Uh, as Randy mentioned a little bit earlier, the AIA is continuing its 2018 public awareness campaign, Blueprint for Better, that brings to life the role of architects as thought and action leaders in improving our cities, towns, and neighborhoods. One of the AIA's main goals is connecting with civic leaders and elected officials. We want to, have, we want to be sure to have architects to have a key seat at the table when important civic decisions are being made. That's what makes AIA Las Vegas' 2019 focus on its community so appropriately aligned with this national effort. As an officer of the AIA Board of Directors, I also sit on the AIA Strategic Council, as Duane mentioned, and that, that group charts the future of the institute and the profession. And when discussing some big ideas at the Council Assembly this summer in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and knowing some of the, the great efforts that were going on around the country, like the one you just saw in Los Angeles, I said, why don't we throw out a challenge for the AIA, AIA to lead a coalition to end homelessness by 2030? That challenge was then taken before the board in the fall and well received, and is being moved, for, it's being moved forward to be discussed at our retreat in our board retreat in Alexandria, Virginia next week in depth. And while the details of the national organizational effort get furthered, it has always been the idea, and Dwayne and I discussed this earlier today, that it, it really be, it'll really be with the components where they'll be carrying out specific actions. The challenges, challenges of homelessness and affordable housing are many, and they vary greatly from community to community. So it really will be up to the local communities and the local components to work with those in their individual communities, like these folks before you tonight, to help develop solutions to the unique challenges of those communities, which is what brings us here tonight. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to help facilitate this AIA-led discussion on the topic, the first of which I hope is of many um, across the country in communities all around the nation. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panel this evening. Um, I'd like to ask them to say a few words about themselves and their organizations and what they're up to. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce is Mike Mullen. He's the CEO of Nevada Hand, a nonprofit company that works to combine private sector development with underutilized federal resources to improve housing opportunities for seniors with fixed incomes and working families. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, everybody. I'm, 
this is my uh, third career. I founded Nevada Hand in uh, 25 years ago, and uh, I guess you could say I'm a real Las Vegas story because I came here in 73 with the idea that I wanted to be a professional poker player. And I lived in my van in the uh, parking lot on Ogden behind, which was then the Mint, now uh, horse, uh, the Horseshoe. Lived there for three months till it got too hot. Got my first apartment in, uh, what's the correct name for the naked city underneath the stratosphere? I can't remember. The Thank you, Meadows Village, <clears throat> and um, became a craps dealer, and I dealt craps for 14 years and uh, sold real estate for 13 years with Americana Group, and then started Nevada Hand in uh, 1993, So, and finally got it right with my third career, and um, couldn't be happier. So I'll tell you more about Nevada Hand in a minute. <clears throat> Thanks. Great. <clears throat> The next panelist I'd like to introduce is Joc Jocelyn Blewett Fisher. She's the director of the Courtyard Homeless Resource Center for the city of Las Vegas and the city's multi-agency outreach resource engagement teams, or more. So welcome, Jocelyn. Thank you for inviting me and for including us in this conversation. Uh, this is also my third career. So I've done, uh, started out doing graphic design, then I worked for the city for a small period of time, went on to do corporate philanthropy and community engagement for the resorts, and then ended up back with my love and my passion doing work that improves the community and doing work for government. Um, it is quite rewarding to be invited to a conversation like this, to see that there are other members in the community who are interested in learning more about this issue that impacts us all. So I really look forward to some good conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you for being here. Uh, the next member of the panel I'd like to introduce is Patricia Cook Craig. She's an associate professor at UNLV in the School of Public Policy and Leadership in the College of Urban Affairs. And she's been, um, uh, her recent work focused on the evaluation of violence pre prevention and the role of violence, is, violence in homelessness. So welcome, Patricia, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. Um, let me first say I'm uh, very honored to be here tonight and to spend time with you um, and couldn't be more excited about the initiatives that AIA um, are including us in. Um, I guess this is my second career, so maybe I have one more left in me. <laughs> um, I started out as a social worker. I'm a social worker by training, and I started out working um, in shelter programs, and that really never left me, um, and that was... Um, uh, in Texas, and then I, what I realized was um, I was around brilliant, amazing social workers and human service professionals, and we were throwing everything we had at the problem, and the problem wasn't getting any better. 24 <coughs> years later, the problem wasn't getting any better, so I said I have to go back and get my PhD and find out what works, and I've been doing that ever since. So um, I am one member of a larger team at UNLV, and particularly Greenspun College of Urban Affairs, that is really trying to take a deep dive into helping work on this issue in, um, in uh, Las Vegas, in Clark County, in the region, working especially um, lately with Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth and Arash, um, as well as SANS Cares to try and uh, impact youth homelessness. So looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And the final member of our panel tonight is Arash Kafori. He has leveraged his diverse background in policy, academia, and the startup and corporate worlds to transform Nevada's partnership for homeless youth into a community leader on issues affecting Southern Nevada's homeless youth. Um, he serves on the board of, of the National Network for Youth, the advisory board of National Safe Place, and the Southern Nevada Homeless Continuum of Care Board. So welcome, Arash. Uh, thank you, AIA, for putting this together. Thank you all for attending. Um, <clears throat> I. Uh, I'm not on my third career, and you basically said everything I was going to say oh, in terms sorry. of what I am doing. No, no, I'm kidding. Um, so I, I guess I'm sort of on my second career. Um, after, after school, I had dreams and aspirations of either being a, a lawyer or a diplomat. Um, but I, I started my career in the private sector working for corporations and startups, et cetera, as an analyst, um, and even did a little stint at a civil engineering firm doing business development. Um, but one of my mentors, um, 
really instilled in me a passion for bringing business acumen and business skills and that sort of type of environment and framework to the nonprofit sector and to see how we can leverage those things and use minds that we typically have in the private sector in the public sector and see what we can do out of that in terms of innovation, in terms of moving the needle faster, et cetera. And uh, thankfully to uh, him, Dr. Keith Schwer, who actually used to work at UNLV in the Center for Business and Economic Research, I found my passion, which is the intersection of business policy and community, and also uh, homeless youth as well. So um, here I am, and my job and is to do anything and everything I can as a homeless youth advocate uh, to help these youth have the same quality of life that the many of us share in this room. Thank you, Arash. Um, so I'd like to get us start off, uh, start the conversation off on a positive note. And mm -hmm. I'd like to ask, because it is such a challenging topic, I think we need to, to, to think positive. And I'd like each of you to take a few minutes, perhaps, to describe one of your organization's greatest successes and really how that came to fruition. So I'll ask Jocelyn first, put you on the spot. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll talk a little bit about one of the city's most recent um, endeavors is the Courtyard Homeless Resource Center. So we had done surveys of the homeless people who chose to live on the street and they would attach their tents to the gates of our shelters, but they wouldn't go in. We also did some community charrettes to talk about if we were to do something design-wise in the Corridor of Hope, what would that look like? What services and resources would need to come in? And so from all those conversations came the brainchild of the courtyard. So right now the courtyard is a old building and some parking lots that we're trying to make work, but we have been working with some amazing architects to design a space that will be a place that people want to be, not a place that people feel like they're forced to be. A lot of times in our community, we do a lot of saying where homeless people can't be. You can't be behind a business, you can't be in an alley, you can't be under the freeways. But we really never say where they can be or where they should be. Even though we have shelter beds, at 6 a.m. when our shelters empty and release everyone out to the street, they have to have a place to go and a place to exist. Human beings don't just evaporate just because you don't want them to be there. So the courtyard serves three purposes. One, it is a safe place where people can get off the street and get some respite. Um, we provide um, air during the summer, we provide heat during the winter, and we are a 24-7 facility, so people are allowed to stay with us as long as they wish. While they're there, if they um, choose to engage in services, we have caseworkers and navigators on site who are there to connect people to resources, do an assessment, determine what they need, and then try to get them hooked up with that service um, to help them on their way out of homelessness. And then additionally, um, with this being a safe zone, there's a lot of violence that happens um, in Foremaster and around the, the uh, Corridor of Hope area. So we have security that's on site, not because we're afraid of our guests, but because we want them to feel safe. We literally have had people run across our threshold to escape something that's happening on the street because they know when they cross our threshold, they'll be safe. So that is our most recent endeavor is the courtyard. Um, we started out, we bought the property, and so we said we own the land. We don't want to wait to do a full build out before we start helping people. We opened our doors to start helping people right now. We originally thought we would sleep about 120, 150 people a night. Last night we slept 236. <laughs> and what would you say you mentioned you you bought the property. So how did how did that come about? How was the financing available to the funding available to do that? So the purchase of the land has been from two sources that are available to the city. One is our community development block grants or CDBG, and the second is our redevelopment set aside. Um, we are uh, eighteen percent of the set aside from the redevelopment area goes towards social services and towards education. And so with that money, we were able to do some land purchases. Um, when we bought the land, we weren't really sure what we were going to do with it, but based on the community conversations and based on uh, the input from the homeless folks who were living on the street, uh, the courtyard was born. Great. Uh, Arash, can you share with us uh, maybe one of your more recent successes in, in addressing especially youth homelessness? Um, sure. There's. Um 
That's tough. We're, we're proud of everything we do, and we're, as a community, trying to fire in all cylinders. Um, uh, MPHY's uh, Nevada Partners Film is Youth. We kind of have evolved into having two identities. One is as a uh, high-quality direct service provider to homeless youth, and that's the only population we focus on, and we live and breathe homeless youth. But we realized that one of the biggest issues in our community that homeless youth are facing at a macro level is the fact that not enough of us in the community know about the issue of youth homelessness, nor do we know how each of us in our respective areas and our respective talents, et cetera, can be mobilized to help around the issue of youth homelessness. And I can assure you, no matter what you do, no matter what your profession is, um, no matter what your talent is, there's an opportunity for you to help and get involved in fighting the issue of youth homelessness here locally. Um, but to that point, we realized that fighting the battle just as a direct service provider isn't gonna move the needle fast enough. So we wanted to create a sense of urgency and a public face in terms of that sense of urgency around the issue of youth homelessness. We wanted to humanize the issue. We wanted people to better understand the fact that homeless youth is a very unique issue, and it's not just a microcosm of adult homelessness. It happens for very different reasons. It happens oftenly, suddenly, and unpredictably beyond their controls, because homeless youth as young as 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, they're not really masters of their own domain. And when I was 14, 15, 16, I certainly didn't have the wherewithal to understand how the community worked, how to take care of myself, um, the realities of, of, of sort of becoming an adult and becoming a self-sufficient and independent adult. So one of the things that we're proud of is that we started the movement to end youth homelessness here in Southern Nevada. And it's not just an MPHY product, it's actually a community product. It's for everyone and anyone who has an interest in fighting the issue of youth homelessness uh, to really jump on the bandwagon and be part of a movement. But to start a movement, we need to get a bunch of people in a room. But besides getting a bunch of people in a room, we need to develop sort of a common roadmap, a framework, a master plan for where we want to go and what we want to do with the issue of youth homelessness. So as opposed to right now, we didn't have necessarily a master plan. Recently, in November of this uh, last year, we just released the first ever Southern Nevada plan to end youth homelessness. And this is a product that we did in conjunction with all the jurisdictions, every other youth provider, adult providers, UNLV, funders. I mean, it truly was a collaborative public-private partnership effort just to produce a plan, basically, in, in your world, right, the master architectural plans of what fighting the issue of youth homelessness could look like in our community. So we just sort of completed, in, in your guys' world, uh, the design side, and now we're working on the build side, which is mobilizing even more members of the community to start actually helping us drive and bring to fruition each of the objectives and strategies identified in that plan, which is what Dwayne was mentioning. Uh, he attended the summit where we unveiled that uh, to the community. So we're very proud of that. Um, but there's many other things that we're doing also to directly impact youth. But from a macro level, it's very important that we be thinking about the issues that affect them and how different systems can come together to solve the issue. Because not one system, not one sector, and not one agency is going to be able to solve such a complex issue. Great. And was was the industry, the, the professions around the built environment involved in part of that plan too? The architects, planners, engineers, contractors, did they, did they play a role in helping, or was there a piece of the plan that, that was gonna be put on them to, to carry out? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, not only were, were they involved and some are actually in the room, and there's many others that uh, were involved that weren't in the room, not only were they involved, um, in the sort of the planning phase, but they're especially gonna be involved on the implementation side because we're gonna need a lot of very creative minds to sort of have a paradigm shift on how we think about housing solutions and other supportive services that affect youth and how we can actually couple and relate those things. So there's a lot of work ahead that that really is in the wheelhouse outside, of, uh, in wheelhouses that are typically outside of the nonprofit sector. We don't have architects um, on our staff. We don't have, <laughs> Uh, amazing sort of planners on our staff, et cetera. So we're really gonna have to work with the community, not just necessarily to do more of what we're doing, but also to re-envision what we're doing and how we can do it better, how we can learn from communities across the country, Canada, across the world, actually, and also understand what unique nuances are here that aren't anywhere else, and then come together and figure out how we can create, for example, in this context, even more innovative and unique housing solutions that actually work for our different types of homeless populations. Because unfortunately, it's not a one size fits all. 
Yeah, and I think those are the opportunities and the connections and the partnerships that that we as architects need to investigate and participate in and, and take advantage of to help uh, help um, with the solution to the to the issue. Absolutely. <coughs> Uh, Mike, can you tell us a little bit uh, about HAND and maybe some of your recent successes? Sure. Um, I think the most recent is um, the uh, Boulder Highway Collaborative Campus uh, located on Boulder Highway between Desert Inn and Flamingo. And it was an old uh, trailer park. Um, and we uh, located 200 and <clears throat> we redeveloped uh, the site with 274 units of affordable housing. Uh, it was co-located with uh, a Title I charter school. Mater Academy is our neighbor to the east or to the west. And uh, on site, we have a 10,000 square foot uh, state-of-the-art boys and girls club. Um, we also have a 10,000 or an 8,000 square foot uh, headquarters for Lutheran Social Services um, and a state-of-the-art food pantry. And we actually have another pad in front that uh, we could put at roughly about 10,000 square foot building. And we're debating uh, between a preschool or um, possibly a federally qualified healthcare center or another health facility. So the idea, and we're located on Boulder Highway on both an express uh, line and a local line for uh, transportation. Out in front of our site, they're actually gonna put a, a crosswalk so people quit getting killed on Boulder Highway, crossing it. And um, I think the, um, so I think that the collaboration of having the services right on site for our residents, uh, knowing that their kids are safe after school in the Boys and Girls Club, literally in their own backyard, um, and having access to transportation and affordable housing is uh, kind of a first for Nevada. And it was, um, you know, as much good timing in the round of, um, of the grant making in the county. Um, and the county actually does large, uh, every five years with their CDBG funds, they do large uh, developments. Um, and we happen to be on the cycle. So the Boys and Girls Club, uh, the collaboration with the Boys and Girls Club and Lutheran Social Services, uh, the county liked the idea of that, and so they committed uh, a roughly $6 million um, CDBG grant, which is the largest CDBG grant to nonprofits, um, I think, in the state history. So it's, uh, we've just leased up, uh, been open for about a year now, and um, it's, things are going pretty well. And I would like to say that our, <clears throat> our core constituency, our residents really are working families and seniors with limited incomes. Um, but I think the second thing that uh, we're most proud of was prior to that, we uh, built or were the construction managers and development partners with help of Southern Nevada and Falala and created the uh, Shannon West Homeless Youth Center and provided all the, or helped organize all the funding from all the local jurisdictions, new markets tax credits, pull all the complicated finance together. Um, we actually built the building um, with our construction company. And um, so it was a kind of a turnkey development for um, help of Southern Nevada. And um, as we did with the Boys and Girls Club and Lutheran Social Services, we think we'd like to use our real estate expertise to help other nonprofits and work with you all to figure out how we can um, find homes for nonprofits, not just residential housing, but for their own office use or administrative use. That's great. So it sounds like your, your organization is really about making the right connections, bringing to, together the right coalitions to solve the specific problems and going after the, the most appropriate funding to get it done. Is that, That's true. Is that fair? That's fair. And I think uh, when we, as we talk about homeless, we have not been, um, in the homeless <clears throat> housing, but permanent supportive housing, we need a place for the people in the courtyard to go. We need many places for the people in the courtyard to um, get to transfer into either a transitional setting or permanent supportive housing. <clears throat> and there's very little of that. Um, it's in our strategic plan to um, try to connect the dots this year. It's extremely difficult. Um, 
in, in the fact that the, the capital to build the building is something we know how to do, and we can do that pretty easily. But the fact of the matter is you need a rental subsidy, which is either um, a rental voucher um, for something to cover the operating expenses of the building. You need to have um, an expert that knows about case management for uh, most of this population is, um, has, well, half of the population, according to Deacon Tom, is, uh, is either have uh, drug and alcohol or addictions or mental illness. So we need case management and people, there are experts, but trying to figure out how to gather them all together, how to pay for the case management, how to pay for the case manager says you need this service and that service. How do you pay for those services, whether it's mental health service and, um, and then understanding how to operate the actual buildings is a, is a little foreign to us because we don't know the difference. I mean, we operate 4,200 units, but this is a population we're not familiar with. So, um, but I think this year we've made the commitment and our boards talked to try to figure out how to connect the dots. And as you said, kind of um, play like a, either the quarterback of the team, but we don't really know what play to run, I guess you could say. So um, <laughs> we could use all the help in design and connecting the dots with all of those um, different sources of capital. Great. Um, as an aside, Randy reminds me that the, um, the annual count on homelessness uh, was conducted last evening, perhaps. Does anyone know where that number shook out? By any chance? Yeah, we oh, just did they? the count, but okay. we probably won't get those numbers and they won't be released until probably, um, I'd say early, later this year. Okay, okay, so it takes some time. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I would like to add on um, uh, Mike's comments that um, when he was describing, uh, what do you call the, the, uh, the Boulder Highway development there? Collaborative campus. Collaborative campus. When he was describing the collaborative campus, it, it really started, it really jived with me in terms of one of the points that I wanted to make tonight about how we think about um, affordable housing or just building housing for our populations is, is to not just think about necessarily how they interact within the building or, the, or the, the housing infrastructure itself, but also really zooming out and thinking about the function and relationship between the client and those living in theirs and the neighborhood, whether they're near an urban core or not, whether they have many of the things that, that, that Mike just outlined, access to easy transportation, access to easy uh, daycare. For example, in the, in, in the neighborhood that, uh, that I, I, I did not know this, when you're a craps dealer in Meadows Village, for example, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that there's not a grocery store within 2.2 miles of that neighborhood. So all these little things, you know, it's easy for us to think about, let's build a place and put clients in there. But if we really want to be successful, it's some of those things that, that Mike is also talking about too, those, those next steps. How does a client interact with that environment? How can they access those supportive services? If they have to get on a bus three hours away to go to their job or go to see their counselor, et cetera, that, or, or to even drop off their kids so they can go work, that becomes a really huge barrier. So I think one thing that I want to encourage is us to really zoom out and think about that relationship with the neighborhood, think about what the client's needs are, and how we can be delivering there. And I think it's also cool to hear you talk about, even on a nonprofit side, how we need to connect the dots between something as macro as development and as micro as how we're actually interacting and servicing those clients that are within those developments as well. And that comes from kind of all of us coming together more and having these type of discussions. And I think design plays a large part in that as well because people usually think of permanent supportive housing or housing for the homeless as something that looks institutional. And so when we're looking for plots of land, available land to build these things, there's a lot of nimbyism, not in my backyard, I don't want those people near me and so on. <clears throat> but if something is designed correctly, it blends into the neighborhood and you don't know if it's affordable housing or if it's permanent supportive housing or some sort of mix therein. And that's what's really important because all of the affordable housing, all of the permanent supportive housing doesn't belong in the, in the urban core. It should be spread out throughout the community, and in order to do that, it needs to look like and feel like the rest of the community. So to that end, I was gonna jump to a question um, that I was gonna ask a little bit later, but uh, AIA New York 
has developed, uh, helped develop affordable housing design guidelines that include lessons such as being creative with massing and respectful with scale, designing with the neighborhood in mind by integrating absent services, uh, and not to make affordable housing look like affordable housing. So it sounds like Las Vegas could benefit from a similar set of guidelines, and maybe what are some local, local lessons that could be learned that could be incorporated into such uh, design guidelines? So I, <clears throat> I think the design of the exterior, um, first of all, I think we would welcome any, um, any of the, and I saw in the Skid Row Housing Trust, um, and by the way, Mike Alvidres is gonna be here at the mayor symposium, or there's a symposium coming up in a month or so. Um, and the idea of designing exterior t for, um, for the neighborhood, but equally, how, how do you come up with a creative design that's an efficient use of space, number one, but still has a sense of community on the inside, too? So we saw that in some of the, I was struck by some of the community rooms and, um, and the community spaces, um, and the idea that um, people feel at home and have a sense of home is critically important for the client, as well as you know, the business sense of making sure the building uh, is equal to or better than the neighborhood um, that it's in. Um, so in terms of exterior design. So I think there's a, there, there is a terrific learning and then I guess you guys could figure out how in New York they want to keep heat in and, and in Las Vegas we want to keep heat out. So how we change the exteriors to uh, suit the environment but um, it would be tremendously helpful to have, in, in our buildings, we have a, a, what we think is a pretty efficient unit plan. It's hard to do the same building because of lot sizes, et cetera, but it's not hard to play Tetris in a multi-story building with unit plans that you feel are you know, pretty, that, that meet the needs, and I think it's important that we figure out also um, in permanently supportive housing, and it's, it's done all over the country, but you know, what is an efficient unit and what is, um, you know, how much uh, closet space, pantry space, how much, um, what's too much, what's not enough, how do you get industrial strength yet still feel like um, you're providing a home environment? Those are all really um, tricky balancing act that I think could use the help of the bright minds in the room. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, Patricia, I'd like to shift gears to go back to something that Jocelyn touched on earlier. Unfortunately, um, there's a large amount of violence surrounding our homeless population. And um, what, what has been some of your experience or research on, on what leads to that or how it exacerbates the problem? Um. Yeah, so let me take that question, and I do want to talk about a success as well, if I oh, might. Oh, yes, please, I'm a, sorry. <laughs> just a moment of time, but, um, you know, I think that's a complex question, mm -hmm. but one of the things I think uh, it's important to note is that um, homelessness uh, comes along with it an extreme amount of vulnerability. So, you know, when you think about um, when you leave here tonight and where you go, you're going to go to some place that you... <coughs> Um, uh, presumably is uh, a safe place to be, some place where you have um, shelter parameters, um, a comfortable place to kind of uh, live your life. And uh, homeless folks don't have that. Being out on the street, um, you're vulnerable to crime, you're vulnerable to sexual exploitation, particularly young uh, homeless youth and children. Um, you're vulnerable to elements, uh, and so that I think is a real big part of the answer around violence. I mean, I think um, one of the things that is often a myth is that um, violence are, is something that um, homeless people are perpetrating. Um, and, you know, more often than not, violence is something that homeless people are experiencing. Um, and so I think that that's a, a big part of the answer to that question, although it's a complex question. I did want to talk a minute about um, Success, and I think uh, Arash uh, said it well when he said it's hard to pick something, but the success that I'd like to talk about that I consider one of my greatest recent successes is sitting here tonight in this room. Um, and so I've studied a little bit about collaborative relationships and how collaborations work well. Um, and, 
you know, some of the most successful collaborations are built upon what other people would call unlikely partnerships. Um, and that's what this is. So if you would have asked me a year ago, where was I gonna be invited to speak about homelessness, it would not have been to the AIA meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and yet here I am. And the other thing I, I think I've learned across my career about collaborative relationships is, it's often those non-traditional partnerships where the game changer happens. And um, you asked about the census, so we don't have the 2019 numbers, but if we look back to the 2018 numbers, um, the estimate was that on any given night, there's 6,083 people homeless. More often than not, that person doesn't have shelter. So more often than not, that person is unsheltered. Um, and in that same 2018 census, we had 945 available permanent housing beds of some sort. Um, we have a numbers problem here and we're looking for a game changer. And I think that game changer might be in this room. And so when Dwayne introduced his uh, opening remarks and he said, we need you, I'd like to underline that, italicize it, bold it, um, and put it in a different font to say, we, we need you. And I think that the thing that we are learning and getting better and better at um, nationally uh, and here in, in Las Vegas is the building of those unlikely partnerships to figure out what the game changer is, what the new idea is that we have not put on the table yet, but that needs to happen. Great, so to, to that end then, um, this, is, this is sort of a, a, a three-part question, but one of them had to do with relationships and alliances. Um, what is what is the typical governmental leader's view on homeless uh, on the topic of homelessness and how they feel it can be best addressed? And are we are, are they on the right track? Or are there other other partnerships and alliances that they could be looking towards to maybe come up with better solutions or better uh, better ideas? I'm guessing this question is for me. Whomever, um, <laughs> jump in. I don't know that there is a typical um, government leader's mindset about homelessness. I think it impacts their residents, their um, people that live within their jurisdictions in different ways. And so that colors and shades how they think about it and what they think some of the solutions might be. Um, what we have been charged with in the Department of Community Services is to do something different, to be disruptive because what we've been doing in this community for so many years has made an impact, but it hasn't been a game changer. We are still seeing our homeless numbers grow. We are still seeing um, a large percentage of homelessness in our downtown area in the city's urban core. So to keep doing what we've always been doing just wasn't enough. So the city was willing to step up and say, all of our CDBG dollars, we're putting it all in and investing. All of our RDA dollars as well, we're putting it in and investing to try to come up with something new and different um, that would be that game changer. So we have been having the conversations about, yes, the courtyard is a starting point, but it's not the end all be all and it won't be the solution that will end homelessness. Um, what it is, is um, a start, a safe place for people to be so that they aren't victimized and a part of whatever is happening out on the street. And really, I hear all the time that people say, oh, I met a homeless person or I saw them and they're service resistant. That's not a term that I um, adopt because I don't see someone as being service resistant if they are in survival mode, if they are so entrenched in their addictions that if you're talking to them about a future or coming into housing so that you can have a better life, they can't hear a word that you're saying because what they're focused on is how am I going to be safe tonight? How am I going to get my next fix? So it's not that people are service resistant, it's the hierarchy of needs. If I don't feel safe, if my basic needs aren't being met, I can't think about the future at that point in time. So the design for the courtyard is to be that safe space so that you have a place where you can decompress, where your basic needs are being met, and then we can start to have that conversation about what happens next. I would also jump in to say, yeah, um, I'm not necessarily sure what I worry about is the, the way that homelessness is viewed um, by officials, but I do think there is a key feature of the region that is a little bit different than some communities maybe, and that is the amount of jurisdictions that are involved, right? So we have 
Clark County who um, leads the continuum of care, which leads the HUD funding um, uh, in the in the um, in the area. You have the city of Las Vegas, the city of North Las Vegas, the city of Henderson, and so when we're trying to work together, that's a very cl complex structure of jurisdictions to bring people together. Um, and so that you know that complexity brings with it. Um, a greater challenge around planning, around collaboration, around working together. So I'm not really sure if I worry as much about how how city officials view it or how county or, or jurisdictional um, folks view it as much as just how do you kind of get that work done across those jurisdictions. Do you find their their approaches are different or that, and that's, that's what makes it partly um, challenging or are certain elements taken on by certain jurisdictions and, and they're like, well, we do this and you guys do that and don't bother us and we won't bother you or, or what's your thought on that? So I'm gonna throw that to my panelists. I've lived in the area for three years. Okay. That's probably a high hill for me to answer okay. that. Um, but I would throw it to anybody else on the panel who sure. might have a feeling about that. Yeah, Rash, you were gonna jump in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so there is collaboration amongst the jurisdictions. We all participate in the continuum of care. We all participate in the interlocal agreements that fund our shelters and our HMIS system and all of those things. Um, it's not that we view it differently or that there's this great coordination again, uh, across jurisdictional lines. It's that um, for us, it was an issue that was impacting us greatly and probably most out of all the jurisdictions. All of our community's homeless shelter, all of our community's homeless shelters are located within the city of Las Vegas. So when people are identified in other parts of the city and they're brought into shelter, they're brought within our urban core. So it is a growing problem that we had to address immediately. And so it's not that we ever stepped away from the regional conversation. We're still a part of that. We still invest in that. We still participate in all of that. But we couldn't wait to address the issue that was impacting us immediately right now. So we had to start doing something. Um, I'll lightly touch on that, but then go back to the prior thing. I'll just say that I think um, uh, jurisdictions have different budgets, slightly different um, roles in terms of functions, like the relationship between the city and the county, et cetera. But I think, um, I think and hope that there's an increasing appetite at the jurisdictional level to, to really also develop sort of a common sort of, you know, uh, goal and plan and be able to like both say, we'll do this together and we're gonna divide and conquer on this, but really be on the same page of where they're, master goals are at the end of the day, making sure that they're not in conflict and that that you work together while still respecting that there's slightly different incentives, different budgetary constraints, and different roles that they have to play to do that. But um, something that I am really wanting to make sure that our electeds, uh, I, I, I'd like to see electeds view homelessness and those that are working within the local governments to, to fight the issue of homelessness we seem to be very reactive as a community and as a nation to a lot of our social issues. You know, we're waiting for heroin needles to be in people's arms and this and that, and sometimes we, we can't do anything about it, but I'd like us to start thinking about, to the extent possible, prevention. How we can be in the game of preventing f people that are near homelessness from entering into homelessness, as well as making sure that we can prevent or mitigate or shorten the length of future instances of homelessness as well as, and this is especially relevant to, to the population that I represent, which is homeless youth, because homeless youth, if nothing is done, can go on to be clients at any type of agency that we have in our community, whether they're at a homeless adult place, whether they're in the legal system, whether they're uh, a sex trafficking victim, whether whatever the case may be. So we can build and build and build more housing and more this, and we need to, uh, for example, Nevada and Las Vegas have led the nation in having the highest percentage of our homeless youth being unsheltered, with over 90% being unsheltered on the streets. And that's been going on since they started tracking that data in 2013. So not only do we just have a huge homeless number, a huge percentage of them are unsheltered versus other communities that have huge homeless numbers, they have 
more resources. So instead of us building more, and we need to build more, we also need to be thinking about how we can actually stimmy and reduce demand for these type of, 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 of transitional and other temporary housing. It's not permanent housing, because we need more permanent housing, and we need really affordable permanent housing in this community, for sure. But in general, when it comes to how electives view homelessness, I'd like to start seeing some investments in the prevention side as well. And Arash brings up a great point. Again, this is where we need the community to come in and support and assist these efforts, because for a long time, and still a large percentage of, a large part of now, we as a community rely on our federal dollars, our HUD dollars, our CDBG, and so on, to address the needs of homelessness. And when HUD provides the money, they get to set the tune. So if they say the focus is on people who are chronically homeless, then that's what it is. If they say that there's a coordinated system that allows people to be eligible for housing, that means if I have someone standing in front of me right now who is ready to go into housing, if they're not next on that list, I can't help them. So without discretionary dollars, there is no prevention. Without discretionary dollars, there is no way to address those immediate needs. So as a community, we have to decide that this is an issue we are willing to address and we're willing to step up and start to get engaged in. Because if we always rely on the federal dollars, we'll never make a dent in this program, I mean in this issue. Uh, jurisdictions all around the country who have made successful efforts in reducing the amount of homelessness in their communities have all had a dedicated funding stream. Philanthropy is great, donations are fantastic, but our community's safety net can't be a one-time gift. It really does require a sustainable funding source that will keep the safety net in place year over year. <clears throat> so to tag on to that, I think you talked about the community leaders. I think it was just earlier this week in this room that the Commissioner Clark County Board approved the marijuana tax, uh, $12 million of their marijuana tax to be applied to homelessness. So that's an example of exactly what you were talking about are some funding streams. I know the city's got some um, <clears throat> ideas or bills at the legislature to um, for either some transfer tax or some sewer fees to be a de dedicated uh, funding stream um, for uh, homeless housing as well. And I think, um, so in terms of electeds that we're talking about, at the legislature, uh, the, there was an interim committee on affordable housing um, that was managed by Senator Julia Ratty. And we think there's gonna be uh, several bills from that um, that we would appreciate the support of the folks in this room, ways you could support. One is a state tax credit, um, a gaming tax credit effectively that mirrors the low-income housing tax credit. Um, it's 10 million, it's a pilot program of $10 million a year for four years. Um, it's it made it into the governor's budget and the state of the state, uh, so that's good news. Um, and I think it's still gonna take a lot of hard work, but that would, according to the housing division, increase the number of units they could produce by about 600 units, and they traditionally only, because we're a small state, uh, produce about 1,000 units a year. So it's a, it would be a big, uh, a big jolt and a nice, uh, you know, the combinations of lots of little things. Uh, we also have two underutilized federal resources in Nevada, and one is BLM land. <coughs> Uh, much of it is targeted for, not much of it, about a thousand acres, I think, is targeted under Southern Nevada Pub Public Lands Management Act to be affordable housing in sites across the valley. Um, the county is moving forward with some of that land. And the 4% uh, bond program is, is underutilized for low-income housing tax credits. <clears throat> so finding ways to help supercharge that um, would be helpful. I think another bill uh, is, uh, is something called a 1915 waiver that allows Medicaid to actually uh, pay some of their funding towards housing costs. And I think um, people are understanding that in social determinants of health, the single biggest indicator of some adult health is the zip code that they live in as a child. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> you know, in terms of um, allowing Medicaid to play, pay for housing and, and safe, decent, affordable housing 
is sometimes con considered a vaccine in health and housing to be the first start on Maslow's hierarchies. So um, that's a, that would be a bill that we would urge support for. Um, there's another bill uh, that just kind of clarifies home rule and home rule, uh, many of you are probably familiar is that, I'm not that familiar and I'll probably screw it up, but I think it basically says the local jurisdictions can't really do anything unless the state specific, specifically authorizes them to do it. And um, we as affordable housing advocates have been um, uh, sometimes skeptical of whether counties were blaming, um, not the county, but the local jurisdictions were using that a little more um, conservatively. And so there's a bill to pretty much reaffirm the fact that, um, that the local jurisdictions can do X, Y, and Z. I haven't spelled them out. And I think at the very least, it's not a bill, but something that we've been advocating for and I think the, the, you guys understand, if any of you are design projects and guiding them through the planning and the entitlement process, is the time it takes to get um, from design to the first uh, construction start is significant. And a lot of that is the, uh, the local jurisdictions. So one of the things, you know, for anybody that's want to listen, with the few affordable housing deals that are done in, in Nevada, you know, a simple front of the line pass like they do at uh, Universal Studios or, you know, Disneyland, a fast pass. Um, how do you, how you can do that? And Clark County actually has that on, I, now I'm losing my memory on, I think it's the, one of the planning sides of it. But if we could simply get speed up the time frame by a few months, that would save a significant amount of dollars. And the last thing I'm going to say, I've been hogging the microphone, is, uh, is I, I really think the, the, in the design side and understanding how, how can we, what are the new technologies, what are the new design materials, is, is panelized housing something worth looking into? Um, it, you know, I know people talked about container, we have container housing, uh, we've seen modular housing, but now panelized housing. Is there any savings there? Are there, how do we get, start talking about cost efficiencies, whether it's a, a standard unit, and yet maintain the, the quality uh, that the neighbors are going to okay, and therefore the electeds, and the interior quality that um, people feel at home, and, or more than a home. So, enough said. <laughs> you no, talked about elected, so you sent me on a rant. No, that's, I, I, I encouraged you all ahead of time to, to take the conversation where it led, so thank you for that. And, and to answer some of that, I know that there have been some uh, advances in some um, in manufactured housing and high-quality manufactured housing, too, and, and more of that is coming, and uh, that could be, a, that could be a, a, one of the solutions that are brought to the table by, by this community to help, to help address the issue. Um, sort of along these lines, I, I, I had a question I was going to ask about y your views, uh, how you all view local laws and planning and zoning ordinances and how they, they either hinder or potentially could help address the issue. And one of the things you had mentioned earlier about the different lobbying efforts or the, um, the, the interesting, uh, the relevant bills that, that, that might uh, they could use the support of our community. I mean, we have a, a pretty robust advocacy effort uh, throughout, uh, throughout the Institute at the national level and each of the states too. So if there are specific things that, um, that we can help get behind and again, build those coalitions to support good, uh, good laws and good regulations, those are things that I think that, uh, that AI would, would help yeah. step up and support too. So. Well, we actually, for the first time, have, uh, are going to have a Nevada Hand Day up at the legislature, an affordable housing day. Mm -hmm. So I can give you more information on that. Um, Greta Seidman, who's in the room, has arranged that for us. And um, um, I think we really want to make keep the um, affordable housing for the first time in, in the 40 years I've been here seems to be a topic of conversation. That, it, that people are starting to talk a lot, a lot. And whether it's so we don't become Reno where there's no housing for anybody effectively or, um, um, so it's really, it's a, it's a hot topic now and more, and I'm really surprised to 
to hear how often it comes up in, in everyday conversations. So we would like to figure out where we have common, you know, where we're not, mm -hmm. um, um, if, where we have some commonalities and yeah. we can work together in the, in the legislature along this. AIA Nevada, our statewide chapter, is responsible for our legislative advocacy, and certainly we have already begun to look at those bills that you mentioned to prepare for, uh, prepare our lobbyists also for working with us in um, determining how, how to go about either uh, supporting what we need to support or stepping away from those things that we don't want to happen. So, Yes, our advo adv advocacy group will be working on that, and if you could uh, send me those Sure, we'll give you our bills. contact information. Yeah, certainly. And, and one of the other uh, programs that uh, I know has been very useful in, in Phoenix, uh, a few years back that um, when I was the chapter president of the, of the local chapter there, we worked with um, the folks at uh, AI Chicago on a self-certification program. So it was a program that allowed um, registered architects and engineers to certify that their plans met code and didn't have to go through the typical planning and review process that the city would administer to a normal design process. And there was a, it started out with a, a lot of checks and balances and auditing and so on and so forth. And as the, as the program matured and more people became more involved, it became more successful and more successful. So I think there's something like 180 or 190 now um, self-certified professionals in the Phoenix area that can bring in their plans and get a permit in three days rather than three weeks or two months or whatever. And again, there are still checks and balances and there's auditing procedures and so on. And you know, if you fail your audit, you, you can be thrown out of the program and so on and so forth. So there's some, some self-interest in making sure that what architects and engineers are producing are meeting code, but it speeds up the process and it's really a marketing tool for, for our community uh, to go to different developers and folks who want things built and say, well, look, I can get you a permit in three days. It's yeah. gonna be that much time. Hey. <laughs> so maybe things like that could be looked at too from, from, from our community and some of the things that we can do. That's kind of what I was getting at with the, with the question about maybe there's, there's certain planning and zoning issues. Uh, Justin, you mentioned earlier about the, the NIMBYism, right? You don't want it in my backyard, but maybe there's ways that we can convince um, uh, the jurisdictions to be more creative and more thoughtful about the way they administer, administer planning and zoning ordinances to allow opportunities as they arise in the community for us to do creative adaptive reuse projects that might serve homelessness or ways to come up with more affordable uh, housing product in areas that might not necessarily fit that zoning code in the general code or something like that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I'd like to, uh, to move on to kind of a, a question that I had um, and not being in um, on the front lines of this and, and coming, coming to it from a, a design and, and uh, construction built environment perspective. Um, I know that I've, I've learned that housing first is a homeless assistance approach that essentially prioritizes providing permanent housing to people experiencing homelessness, uh, thus ending, ending their homelessness and serving as a platform from which they can then pursue uh, personal goals and improve their quality of life. Um, how do you all view that approach? And if it's a positive approach, it seems that there might be ways that architects can leverage our skills and abilities to help sur uh, support and further it. What are your thoughts on that? Let's take that one. So Southern Nevada is a housing first community. Okay. Um, the challenges we face are, the goal would be to house a person first and then provide the wraparound services that allow them to move forward or to um, eventually gain self-sufficiency. Um, without housing, housing first is a challenge. And then even with that, if there's a, sort of scattered site, we can convince a couple of landlords to say, yes, we'll house this person for you, um, having the resources to have that continual support system there for that person become an even greater challenge because now case managers are going from complex to complex to complex to complex trying to keep an eye and manage the needs of the clients that have been placed there. So permanent supportive housing where it's you know one unit where it's maybe even a mix of permanent supportive housing, affordable housing, and some market rate would be extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. It's just a challenge to be a housing first community without housing. Without the housing, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I would just echo that. Um, 
you know, so the the numbers for for affordable housing are not bad. They're really bad. So in 2017, for extremely low income renters, there was 12 units for every 100 renters. In 2018, there was 10 units for every 100 renters. We're going in the wrong direction. Um, and so while there's good, you know, from a university side, well, there, where there's some good studies and some good evidence that housing first can be a, a great strategy, without the place to put that person, you know, you, you can't move forward. And so what keeps me up at night is not that we have evidence-based strategies that we can put on the ground, what keeps me up at night, and you'll forgive me architects if I use the, this term the wrong way, but what keeps me up at night is how to scale up our solutions, mm -hmm. right? So if you have 6,000 homeless people um, in our city at any given time and you have 945 dedicated housing options or bed options for those folks, you're covering about a little less than 16% of the beds needed. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about what the game changer is, it has to be a scalable game changer. Um, and I agree totally with what um, Jocelyn said about needing dedicated funding streams that are, that are uh, reliable, predictable. Um, it will not, we will not solve this problem just with federal funds that come down um, for homelessness. That's you know, cities that are making inroads have gotten that and have figured that out. Um, but it's not that we don't have strategies that have evidence that they'll work. It's that we don't have the amount, in terms of housing, we don't have the amount of units available. It's, it's a numbers game. And I just want to say affordable housing is great if you are employed but you're maybe making less money, but is it 60% and 30 to 60% of area meeting income? Right. What if you're not employed at all? What if you're living on the street and you're just trying to come back into society? Affordable housing is great, but we also need the housing, the transitional housing programs for people who are just starting to get back on their feet. So I just want to broaden the conversation, not just around affordable housing, but also around transitional housing, rapid rehousing opportunities, and some of those programs as well, because we have people who are living with us at the courtyard who work every day, but can't afford affordable housing. Actually, I just want to echo what, what Jocelyn just said. That's what I was going to say is, is it's not just thinking about necessarily about affordable housing, but thinking about all the type of different housing options that we need in our community for in different populations, whether you measure that on how much time they need, whether it's a transitional type of program, or whether we think about where they are in their lives too. For example, is it the smartest idea to take an 18 year old and put them in an apartment with a one year lease when they really don't have the wherewithal to know where they're gonna be in six months, if they wanna to go to school or whatever the case may be. Um, there's other populations that just need a place for a while but don't necessarily wanna sign a very long-term lease and that creates a lot of uncertainty. And what we don't wanna do is create blowback around affordable housing that we get people in these units signed up and then two months later, you know, they have an external or internal shock to their system, they can't pay their bill, then all of a sudden they have a lease problem, a credit problem, this, and they're right back where they started, but with no option anymore. So we really have to also be thinking about the other services that come and are included or should be included with, you know, sort of affordable housing as well. And also, again, I want to stress that we can't just build it anywhere and hope for the best. We really have to be mindful about how they're going to interact with their, you know, areas, their neighborhoods, their communities, and how they're gonna go from being stably and affordably housed to actually experiencing upward economic mobility, as opposed to just keeping them there forever in that unit, doing the exact same thing over and over, and for some of us to go, well, they're not homeless anymore. Because there's a difference between taking someone on the streets and getting them temporarily housed, or even permanently housed, and then helping them achieve that upward economic mobility so they're just not straddling that line of extremely low income or poverty forever. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about that in terms of zooming out and how we look at those designs and how we look at when we're creating these housing things. But I think the one cool thing is that, not a cool thing is a bad thing, but the opportunity is that we have such a critical shortage that we don't have to repurpose or retool or rethink about 
these housing units and how so far away they are from everything, whatever, but we can try to do it right from the get-go in terms of the best job of creating housing that actually works, interacts well with not only that client, but in the environment they're in, so they can actually get to that upward mobility point. So to put some numbers on the percentages, <clears throat> um, uh, HUD determines low income but 80% of the area median income. So if you're a family of um, three and a half, then, and you make $50,000, $55,000 a year, you're low income. But, well, and if you're a single person, at that you're low income. So, you know, we have this, uh, there's, it was told to me a long time ago by uh, executive director of a housing authority um, that I was talking with Ned about earlier, Bill Cottrell had a statement that really stuck with me when I first started 25 years ago. And he said, in not a very artful way, that, you know, in the low-income populations, you can really divide them into the poor poor, the middle-class poor, and the rich poor. And in terms of the homeless to, say, about fifteen to $20,000 a year, those are extremely low-income folks that probably need some sort of a rental, monthly rental subsidy, whether it's a voucher or a subsidized apartment, et cetera. The low-income housing tax credit program that we work in typically serves people that make about twenty to fifty thousand dollars a year, and that's under that's there's huge need in that area. But there's a, also a need for people that are that make fifty-one thousand dollars a year that don't qualify for our housing, and all the apartments that are being built now, you need to make about seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars a year to afford them. So there's folks in the in the higher uh, income that is, that are in a really that are struggling as well with paying too much of their income in rent because um, you know and we call that kind of the missing middle and we had uh, applied analysis to a supply demand study of those segments and I don't have that numbers handy right now but it's it's really there's housing problems affordable housing problems all the way up till you're making about eighty thousand dollars a year. And it will continue in 10 years from now. If you're making 90 or 100 thousand dollars a year, you're going to have a problem. So it's really something we need to pay attention to all up and down the ladder. And I think you know, at the higher, at the higher incomes, the so-called rich poor, they just need a little help. You know, the the low-income housing tax credit program that we use, we believe in more than a home, so we invest in resident services and resident service coordinators to help our residents try to move up the economic ladder or at least maintain a, a certain status. And so, and then obviously to serve the homeless populations or the extremely low income, it takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of different resources and, you know, particularly when you're talking about homeless with mental illness and or addictions. So. I hate to be throw a wet blanket, but it's a problem not just at homelessness, not just in, um, you know, the, the and, and these people in the service economy, you know, from 20 to $50,000 a year, that's our industrial, I mean, that's warehouse workers with all the warehouses that are coming in. That's our casino industry, our service industry. Um, it's a big problem. So, sorry to <laughs> throw that little wet blanket. Well, let me, let me make it a little wetter. Um, so, no, um, I think, um, I think uh, Dr. Cook Craig was talking about how cool it is to sort of have, you know, non-typical partners at the, avail uh, at the table, and I think that's really key uh, for innovation. But I also think that some of those non-typical partners could be thinking about things that will affect their wheelhouse, but lobby and advocate for something that isn't necessarily related to their wheelhouse. So for example, for architecture, we can talk about a lot of things related to housing and design and changing planning and codes and this and that. But to Mike's point, to everyone else's point here, um, I'm gonna read you a quick stat. To afford a two bedroom apartment in the state of Nevada, one would need an hourly wage of $18.59 or an annual salary of little over 38,000 to afford fair market rent where they wouldn't pay more than 30% of their income, which is how HUD defines it. Now, this equates to a minimum wage worker working 90 hours a week or 2.3 full-time jobs to afford that. To afford a one-bedroom apartment at fair market value, a minimum wage worker would need to work 72 hours per week or 
full-time jobs. So what I mean is that even regardless of us being able to build more affordable housing, maybe some of our non-typical partners, because we've been screaming this, but maybe some of our non-typical partners could be talking and driving conversations about actually creating a living wage in Nevada, so then there we can start and begin affording more fair market or uh, uh, more affordable housing. Because even if someone gave us a magic wand and said, hey, we'll build you 5,000 more, if we don't improve the wage side and the majority of Nevadans, especially down here, over 50% are in service-based jobs where they're making less than $50,000 a year. So as we creep towards that end of minimum wage, even if we had these available units, are we really expecting people to work 72 to 80 to 90 to 100 plus hours a week to stay in those and call that affordable housing. So what I mean is that we, we need to be thinking within our wheelhouses and within our sectors, but we also need to zoom out and think about all the other issues that could help bring a solution to what we're fighting faster. And I think fighting for uh, a living minimum wage is on top of many, is, is right near the top of the list of many things that we need to do that would affect the affordable housing game that doesn't necessarily have to do with building um, or client services even. Patrick, I'd like to th maybe throw it out to the audience and. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say I'd like to, to offer uh, the audience an opportunity to ask a couple of questions, but there certainly seem to be plenty of opportunities and areas where we can get involved and be supportive and, and try to tackle the issue. So um, why don't we have a, a round of applause for our panel, thank you. And if, uh, if anyone has any questions or anything about that was anything specific about that was discussed this evening, uh, feel free to, to, to join us at the mic in the front here and ask away, don't be shy. Patrick, okay. I have a question. Yes, Karen. Could um, anyone on the panel who sits on the Continuum Care Board explain more about that and uh, describe if the private sector is represented on that board? Um, the Continuum Care Board um, is, is a regional body and it's mandated by HUD and in our community, if we're gonna receive federal funding, then we need a local COC, which is called the Continuum of Care Board, which has representation requirements to basically administer those funds, administer the projects that'll be using those funds, make sure those projects are in compliance with HUD regulations, and that the whole community with that funding is working together to, to basically meet HUD's mandates around what that money should be used for. Now COCs, so that's one mandate, but also COCs should be in a business of really representing at a regional level the issue of youth homelessness and engaging with all the other stakeholders that need to be part of the solution, like our private partners, our other jurisdictions, our, um, our nonprofits, et cetera. And our COC does have a requirement that there be different type of representation, so formerly homeless, jurisdictions, service providers, and including a mandate that there actually be some private uh, 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 seats in those. Now, the reality is, is that I think COCs across the country and ours included, we need to do a better job of engaging with our private side uh, partners as well and bringing them into the table. And we're starting to make some efforts to actually bring in more and not just to be part of the conversation, but to actually start, actually have them analyze these issues and help and start driving some of the solutions as well. So um, we still got some work to do, so the short answer is yes, they're represented, but we need a lot more of that representation though. Anything you wanna add to that? Great, any other questions? Yes, John. John, if you could step up to one of these microphones here, the room uh, will be able to hear the question. You could repeat it. The question John, was, John, John you, like, you like to talk, come on up. Yeah. It's gonna be a long night, folks. <laughs> you 
Your comments are limited to three Sorry. minutes. What's that? Yeah, your comments are limited to three night. minutes, we, and yeah, we'll have public recorded. Please state your name and title and affiliation. <laughs> <laughs> No, the, I was, seat, the seat's going to his head. Yeah. He's going to his head. <laughs> he's, I was here for the Supreme Court uh, installation here the other day. So mm. I knew this was going to happen, Court Jennifer. Sitting. Um, <laughs> no, I'm wondering uh, what kind of success rate there is for getting homeless people off the streets and into independence. If you have any kind of statistics. I think it varies from agency to agency and program to program. Um, we're not a direct service provider, so we, I don't have those stats or numbers <laughs> here with me. And I know Rosh can probably speak to his success rate of his agency. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers right here with me. What I can say is through our work with the courtyard uh, in 2017 and 17, 18, which is our fiscal year, we were able to stably house a thousand people. Um, that question is a very longitudinal question because there's many different touch points that especially homeless adults experience from being homeless all the way to being successful independent uh, adults. But what I, so, um, and that's also not exactly my wheelhouse around adult homelessness, but for youth and for um, our agency at Nevada Partnership Homeless Youth, for the youth that we see, we have over 90% of them uh, graduate to independent housing, to stability, and during the course of that, over 80% of them gain or increase income. And the reason that number is not higher is because we've got to remember that they're youth and sometimes we encourage them not to work and actually to be in school instead, um, which helps them with their long-term uh, um, upward mobility. So um, that's from the, the agency side. Now I know as a community and also within the COC, we are working and there's a new sort of data committee that's been sort of established that's gonna be working with UNLV and some other private partners, our, our our uh, data system administrator, which is called BitFocus, et cetera, on really doing more longitudinal analysis of our system, because really right now it's been more output oriented and we wanna get to be more outcome oriented. So I hope in the foreseeable future, we have answers for that as, a, as an entire community for all populations. And also we should keep in mind that success looks different for mm -hmm. every client, it's right. individual. So if um, being able to de detox and get off drugs and be able to um, enter a housing situation is your goal, then we're gonna celebrate that success. If it looks like reuniting with your family and being able to go back home, then we're gonna celebrate that success as well. So sometimes success is very specialized depending on the client and what their overall goal is. <clears throat> So if anybody would like a copy of the housing, affordable, uh, housing affordability study in Southern Nevada that was done by Applied Analysis and actually with a grant from Charles Schwab Bank uh, that we commissioned, um, if you could get your name or email, I'm happy to email that too. It's a year old now, but it's still valid. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a good, it's an interesting study. homelessness, um, what role does individual fostering, group fostering, and, and rehabilitation or bringing child, children back to their families play in, in that, in that uh, area? So the question is, what role does family reunification uh, and, take and, in a fight against youth homelessness? Foster, foster care. Foster care system? Yeah. Um, and, and is there a design problem that we can help solve? Huh. Yeah, there's a lot of design problems uh, to help solve it. I'll give you my card afterwards and we can definitely talk about uh, all those. Um, so uh, it is always our hope and desire when we have a homeless youth cross into any of our facilities is hopefully they can go back home and we encourage and explore frame reunification right off the get-go every time. Why aren't you home? What's happening? Um, Nevada Partnership Homeless Youth, we specialize really in unaccompanied youth, so those youth have been abandoned or discarded or thrown away by their guardians or their parents. So more often than not, uh, reunifying them with their nuclear families is not a very viable option or is gonna require many years of, of counseling and support. Um, 
that could potentially sacrifice the youth's individual development and growth. Uh, so we always work on that. Um, and sometimes it's not the new care family that we can uh, reunify them with, but sometimes it's an older brother or a grandma or someone else that we can connect them with that is supportive or that maybe got out earlier, whatever the case may be, and we do that. But uh, admittingly, out of all the programs that we operate, because of the focus of our population being unaccompanied homeless youth, our family unification program is, is the least successful in terms of the numbers because of the complexity and the laws and barriers uh, that, that we deal with when trying to work with the, the parents. And we have parents that are literally hanging up the phone on us and telling us, F you, you know, we never want to see Johnny again. Or Susie came out as gay, so she has no part in his family ever again, F you and F her. So we, we are dealing with a lot of that constantly. Um, so on the foster care side of things, the reality is, is that, and, and um, I'm giving you rough numbers, but the adoption rates for kids who are double digit age uh, into single family homes goes down to less than 10%. So uh, a lot of these kids that are above the age of 10 years old that we see are not going to single family homes. Um, the demand is not very high. More often than not, they're placed into group homes. And um, uh, the foster care system is, is a good system, but it's also overburdened as well uh, and is experiencing way too much demand and is not a one-size-fits-all solution. So a lot of these kids end up in group homes. Sometimes they can be uh, in 12-plus group <clears throat> homes in one year and deal with an incredible amount of instability within that sector and sometimes run away from those group homes. And unfortunately, it's estimated on a given year about 20 or 30 percent of our, our, our homeless youth are actually former former foster kids as well. So we're working with that system hand in hand to try to figure out better solutions. Uh, the foster care system itself uh, went to the state legislature and was able to extend um, sort of um, extend their ability to provide care beyond the age of 18 to certain clients, so the AB 350. Um, however, uh, that's kind of the sort of the reality is that uh, for individual homeless youth um, that are that are not under the age of 10, they're not, if, if they enter the foster care system, they're usually ending up in a group home, and that's a very mixed bag. So just to tag on to that, the, the foster care system is Clark, under Clark County Social Services, and they're having a new initiative um, to try um, Tim Birch that was here before and now was recruited back to the county. Um, and we had a chat with him this morning with the nonprofit CEO group that I belong to. And he was mentioning that he wants to redo the whole system um, from this proprietary county closed system to recruiting. Um, and his first attempt is um, faith-based uh, churches and places to try to get out in front of the foster kid that, it, that he's seen in other communities where they've, they've really actively recruited in the community. Um, we mentioned to him that Nevadans for the Common Good would be an interesting, they're a faith-based uh, grassroots organization in order to um, try to get, when kids come into the system, either through ju juvenile justice or through um, family dysfunction, you know, those kids are, going to end up here if they're if they don't um, find a loving home and I think his mission um, is to try to get out in front of that and get homes and not be so proprietary have training get really to um, be recruiting parents and have homes ready for the kids so that there's no child haven stay and no um, you know the it, they're less traumatized on the transfer from their nuclear family. So there are some efforts on the county side to try to, um, you know, really be better at the foster care system and to outreach. So they're looking for good foster parents. So unfortunately, we have to wrap up our discussion for this evening, but I really want to thank all of our panelists for being here and sharing their experiences and their insights and their successes and their challenges. There's obviously a lot of opportunities for our profession to get involved and try to help be a part of the solution uh, to affordable housing and homelessness. And uh, Dwayne and, and AIA Las Vegas have a program put together this year to specifically try to do that. And so I look forward to 
uh, hearing about um, your future activities and successes and uh, wish you all in the room success and hope you get involved and participate. And so I'll turn it back over to Dwayne and maybe close on that note and go from there. Patrick, thank you very much uh, for coming up from Phoenix and moderating our panel tonight. And thank you to all the panelists as well. I think a, a wonderful, deep discussion, some good comments from the from the, the audience. And I like, as Patrick mentioned, I would like to encourage all of you to stay, to participate this year in the, in the programs. In March, on March 15th, I believe is the date, we're gonna have some speakers focusing on housing specifically, uh, locally and regionally. Um, so that's gonna be a good discussion. And then as we move throughout the year, we're gonna be meeting again in August. We're gonna have a design charrette, a 24 hour design charrette, where we're actually gonna work on real projects and develop real solutions, working with the city and other jurisdictions, but uh, we've already got that in the works. Um, more details to follow. But uh, thank you all, appreciate you being here tonight and we look forward to seeing you, when's our next meeting? Dwayne, that yes, date Karen. is May 15th? May 15th, right? May 15th. May 15th. But in between time, we will be looking for other opportunities to bring this group together and to look at solutions that, uh, that we can discuss um, and try to further this discussion to coming, coming up with uh, more information and more answers. Yeah, we, we do so, have, a, we do have a, th a think tank organized and we're, yeah. we're, it's open to anybody that wants to join us. Uh, just get a hold of Randy or Kelly or Karen or myself and yes. you'll be informed of when those meetings are gonna be held and throughout the year. So be a part of, uh, be a part of uh, finding the solutions for this problem. That's our objective for this year. Thank you all. And thank our, thanks to our sponsors.